I want to thank Joan and Howard for envisioning this Lane Rider series and really making it a reality. That's great. Lots of people have good ideas, but some people are able to put their ideas into motion, and they have done that. And I want to thank all of you for taking an hour of your precious dwindling life to spend it with myself and the other writers. That's really sweet. And during the first reading in this building, I realized I had been to this place before. And it was in 1968, uh, within a year of having turned 21 years old, we were living down the road, we were starving students living in a duplex down the road behind the adult uh, movie place next to the railroad tracks. And this is the building in which I cast my first vote. In those days, you had to be 21 to vote. And the year I voted in the primaries, uh, Eugene McCarthy won the primary for the state of Oregon. So this building brought back a lot of memories. And I realized that River Road at that time was just a little country road going through orchards and fields. And about the only thing that hasn't changed is that adult <laughs> movie business down there. I'd like to read a piece by another poet, Clarabelle Allegra. I don't know if any of you are familiar with her. She is a Nicaraguan uh, poet who was associated with the Sandinistas. And I love this poem that she wrote. It's called Ars Poetica. I, poet by trade, condemned so many times to be a crow, would never change places with the Venus de Milo while she reigns in the Louvre and dies of boredom and collects dust. I discover the sun each morning and amid valleys and volcanoes and debris of war, I catch sight of the promised land. And Clarabelle said that the line about condemned so many times to be a crow was because she believed that poets, like crows, have merciless eyes. And that merciless eye is turned on observations of life and often on oneself. I think Clarabelle is about 90 or 91 years old now. So I love that poem. The first poem I'm going to read is about Postelsia pomiformis, which is the Latin for sea palm, which grows along the Oregon coast, on the western coast of the United States. And it's a brown algae you can see on the rocks. If you go to the beach and you're in a rocky area and you see a little cluster of sea palms out on the rocks, um, those are brown algae. And they're found kind of in the intertidal zone and this poem is titled, How to Live, because for the many years I lived on the coast, there's lots of depressed people there, as there are anywhere. And people would ask me for advice once and about how do I cope, how do I do this? And so I titled this, How to Live. On the outer rocks, sea palms take the punishment of being born to a place where tide pounds them into supplicant position bent until each surge withdraws. Tide snaps off stiff-necked members. Not bending would be fatal for the sea palm. Here at the edge of a continent, thinkers and lost lovers ponder their universe. Bewildered and numb, or rosy and romantic, the sea has its way with each mind. Watching sea palms bend and then arise beneath the surging tumult of the ocean is a meditation. Seekers will find what they look for. Not soft answers, but the blue truth of water and sky, the growling beast of bare bones and scrubbed rock. The test lies in the eyes and quivering hearts cast upon the sea. Will a watery answer fuel or splinter a spirit? The next poem was a winner in a state contest, and it's called There Are No Wild Canaries Here. Pigeons rest on a winter roof, the owl in the night tree. 
A vulture on a snag opens its wings at dawn. The grizzled man beneath the abandoned railroad bridge risks a tiny fire. But there are no wild canaries here, just warblers and goldfinches who in summer flash yellow plumage. Chief Seattle makes speeches among quivering tree branches and calls to frolicking river otters. His words pop like pitch pockets in slabs propped for a warming fire. How can we own the land, the sky, the air or water, he hisses. The otters continue their fun. Wren tits fuss in the willows. The transient huddled above his tiny flame looks down, thawing his frozen hands. We live above an old abandoned railroad bridge at Hayden Bridge, and so I watch the people there quite often. This is uh, a poem that's included in Red Sulphur Group's new chapbook, which I don't know if you brought it today. Um, it's called, the chapbook is called How to Love Everything, and each of us has three poems in there, and the process of deciding on those three poems was one of the most interesting interactions I've had in a really long time, because we found many poets think one of their poems is really wonderful, and nobody else in the group does. <laughs> And they may all like something else. So it was both humbling and enlightening. And this is called Dolphin and the Owl, and it was voted into the book by my fellows. The Valencia bidet spits a meter away from the dolphin that slid down the Spanish steps. Kiss me, the fake fish says. Kiss and make up. An Italian area adds respite from an eternal root pressing a steady pulse on bread and bricks. History dwarfs empty conversation. Pigeons wing past peach pines while gypsies yawn near the station. Bats sleep beneath cement arches, gluing together a beautiful order, all diamonds in the Mediterranean night. But above the river, a cormorant flaps drawing a clear line between liquid secrets and open sores. Grapes to wine, grappa to vinegar. Thin bird, lord of sunset sky, flies alone into the hollow evening. Such moments burst with divinity and the hoots of mating owls gambling on a throat to lead them to each other. That was written in Rome which I absolutely love that city. And this, I think I will add to the collection of poems that I have written called Killing Off Celebrities. And um, it's about people on the fringe, people that often we don't write poetry about. And this one uh, was inspired by the years that my husband and I lived in the state of Washington. And we spent uh, a good deal of time, of that time, in Aberdeen. So the poem is called The Wet, and it's for Kurt Cobain. For those of you who do not know, Kurt Cobain was the lead singer for Nirvana. Long blocks of mill houses and empty walk-ups rim the district. Dampness sends green streaks across shingles and paneling, making sure any eye notices the suffering and misery of a fight no human can win. And they said he was talking nonsense with his verses, those clashing chords of rock. But he moved away to an upscale house before the persistent damp crept in again, making smears and ugly patterns on his walls. Maybe you have to live there, squatting among mossy ruins and clotted mines to decipher nonsense and what it can do for a heart drowning in a rainforest. Aberdeen is heaped upon mudflat slag and the saturated bones of thousands lost to the gray sea, the mills, those dark and foreboding forests. He was born to the place hatched among ferns, 
spawned in an unrelenting deluge. Here, children commit suicide and parents find their fight songs in a bottle. Kurt, in his tender green beauty, put sincere words to drizzle and the pitch struggle. He made you believe for a brief and dreadful moment that a dry heaven was at hand. I went back and read some of the Nirvana lyrics. He was quite the guy. This is also from the collection of uh, killing off celebrities, and this is called Unplanned. This is about the people I know in Northern California and on uh, some Indian reservations in Alaska. Unplanned. Dogs trample flowers while lapping water from a bird bath, ignoring pet bulls on the path. It's okay. Everyone and everything in this place is unplanned, accidental, edited, and smudged over. Births to girls too young, babies left behind by lovers, taken in by sagging faces, even cars picked up while doing something other than trying to acquire another car. Divorces climb out of people who like each other but cannot live together. The odd, clinically crazy wife throws power struggles when no one is resisting. Fatality rides the ferry in, riffs a new song, bleeds cash for caskets, attorneys, and slippery justice. Mortality looks mossy and blighted, dressed like an itinerant bugler calling dogs inside too soon. And the glue hangs together for these hour-to-hour -hour faces, doctoring wounds with fortified beer and a halo of hemp from God. The Lord doesn't forget that they all believe in forgiveness, redemption, and staying alive in a stew of salt water and sweat, where laws are teased apart by judges maintaining on lithium. This is life in a jury box of accidents, mishaps, and frilly lies. And yes, I actually did know a judge who maintained on lithium. This is from my childhood. It's also in the collection. It's called Upstairs. Belle's house was like velvet wine inside, braided gold cord choked burgundy curtains. Painted claws supported the bathtub where an obese Belle once spent three days waiting to be heard. Her upstairs rooms were perfumed by shady ladies hiding men, except for drunken saps in the side yard. Belle would switch on the porch light and tell them she knew who they were and to vamoose before she phoned their mothers. I was a teenage moth on her ceiling, fluttering near her light. My wings singed with rapture as the morning sun set fire to the crown of a bottle redhead stepping across the road to flinch and flick her route among gabardine and linen suits hung on pegs while the legs got busy with summer sex and winter lies, all pressed to damp $5 bills. Only switching trains banged louder than sweating men in need of a woman. Belle slept through most customers. My moth did too. Arson burned us out of a home and into another elderly wreck, rotted by Belle's urine in the floorboards. It too caught fire, losing a top floor like a clown missing his fright wig. Diabetes grabbed the wheel. Doctors amputated Belle's legs. She hung on fussing over fallen women working upstairs in her collapsing house. My sister who's here today remembers Belle, and Belle was, and I swear, the oldest Avon sales lady west of the Mississippi. And my mother, who had very little money, always managed to find a few cents to buy something from Belle. And she always came at dinner time when it was time to feed her so she'd have tomato soup with us. This is also from that collection. And uh, 
Some of you may recognize some of the details if you're familiar with Coos County, where we lived for 30-some years. Coos County, when we moved there in 1970, had the highest state rates for divorce, child abuse, alcoholism, the rest of the social ills. But the people have more character than, it's a perfect place for a poet to write about. This is called Shooting. Under the influence, bulbous belly shoots younger man when a fist is raised. To strike, who knows. The story comes from grudges and angles, all of them festering to be right in a backwoods drama gone sour. But wobbly facts come muddy and tilted, deciding the money, who gets, who gives, in a dark forest and musty courtroom. It's a drippy, gorgeous backwoods, crowded with deer, bear, hunters, poachers, and wanted men. Suffering and hunger hoist to the air each day. Slopes of waterfalls in kaleidoscope colors rain on, bruised by storm and windfall apples, punching the damp earth even in August. The brain almost, just almost goes insane when humidity crowds skin into a steam. Trespass or push it too far and you might die or find yourself in an ironed gown smoking behind a hospital, hands in shackles. <clears throat> this piece won an award in the state contest and it's called North Korea. His office, oh, I should tell you one thing. The word surge in this is not S-U-R-G-E, it's S-E-R-G-E, -E, as in the fabric. North Korea, his officer's hat is too big. A mushroom blooming above his socialist party brain. Where he lives, his hat says authority, fear of the state. His skull in profile shrinks in the cage of what he knows, what he obeys, his vision squashed by the looming cloud of military surge. This peaked headgear might be hiding a bread roll, a banned book, but in truth, tucked beneath the khaki cloth is lingerie smuggled through barbed wire. The silk camisole, too large for a wife of tiny breast, will be cherished for the risk he took bringing lust to the walls of a government apartment bedroom. And I'm used to using a podium, so. This is called Glass House. My husband Michael retired in April of this year, so you knew something was gonna come of that. It took me six months to adjust to him being in the house that I had always owned by myself for 45 years. Glass house. Out there in the kitchen is the other, up before five, forgetting to tiptoe on eucalyptus wood flooring. He's retired. He applauds sunrise when I want to sleep. He's always there, the other. Quiet in the evening, but rummaging early in this glass house. Night is always coming. The wood contracting, creaking, ticking, girding the clock. We don't often mention the calendar, flailing away in the wind, losing pages like alder leaves dropping in October. And I have a couple, I think I have three poems left. This year I went to a 50th anniversary celebration and ran into my ex-boyfriend from 1963 or 4. And he had one hot car back then. He drove a 1963 and a half red Ford XL with a 390, not the 427 and 4 on the floor. And he went through several sets of tires every year. This poem is called Bad Boy Dragging the Gut. And if you're of my generation, you know what I'm talking about. The tantalizing angles of his smirking face are gone. He is no longer a bad boy luring me in, matching my drift of determined defiance. 
We are now the enemy, the old. The new crop is ripe, pressing against our pocketbooks and patience. We are old. Memory gets blotted, lagging on details, the reasons for fooling with liquor and naughty friends. We have almost forgotten that intoxicating mask of immortality, nothing could kill us. And now he's sagging and stiff, weary from being humbled by his offspring. He's limping. Next, he must learn to die with his dignity leaking and a crooked grin framing his dentures. But a benevolent God in an unseen dimension allows his rubber tires to lay down a sassy squeal and emit a last puff of ethereal blue smoke as he thunders his mighty stallion down the gut of a small town. <laughs> And this is about my sister and I, our mother. Campsite curse. Mother was terrified of disease, intruders, snakes, loud noises, strange cars, darkness, men, and death. She was over her quota on death and garden snakes. But he, my dead father, liked camping. So in his name, we went to a campground not far from my uncle's farm. Didn't matter. Fear finds you any place it chooses. After putting milk and eggs in the creek to cool between stones arranged in a small dam, we set up the cots the mother had earned with books of green stamps. We couldn't sleep on the ground because of imagined snakes. We didn't own a tent. Then around midnight, a car roared up beside our cots, headlights blinding us, a man's voice asking who we were. It was a deputy looking for three men who escaped from a work party. Finally, the deputy realized we were a mother and two little girls. I was sent with a flashlight to the creek to collect our milk and eggs. We were out of that campsite in under 10 minutes, on our way back to town, our fractured family beset by snakes and night and now escaped villains. We never tried camping again. <laughs> and the last piece I will read is a protest poem. Most of you, if you've ever heard me read before, there's always at least one protest poem somewhere in the mix. <laughs> And this one, I told my sister I intended to read it. Since I knew she was here, she said, you'll read it whether I'm there or not, won't you? I said, I sure will. <laughs> this is called After Sex. My sister said that after menopause, her sex drive disappeared. I nodded. So what fills the void of that tiger patch clawed raw with desire and need? I suspect the next seduction is with prescriptions and booze. Maybe deleting emails.